You're listening to On the Tape. I'm Dan Nathan, joined by Danny Moses and Guy Adami. We hope everyone has a happy Thanksgiving. Today, we're talking warning signs under the market hood, crude oil volatility, and we have some NFL picks. Later, we go off the tape with David Rosenberg of Rosenberg Research. Stick around. It's going to be a great show. Hey, everyone. It's Guy Adami here. I wanted to let you know about a live webcast Dan Nathan and I are hosting on December 8th. We'll be covering the market outlook for 2022 with three experts from FactSet. That's going to be live on Wednesday, December 8th at 12 p.m. Register right now by clicking the link in the description of this episode. We hope to see you there. Balance your trading strategy by adding futures. CME Group helps you manage risk and capture opportunities in all market environments. Capitalize on around-the-clock access to highly liquid global futures and options market across all major asset classes. Just visit your online broker and get started. Plug into valuable educational materials and trading tools and see what adding futures can do for you at cmegroup.com slash on the tape. Danny Moses, are you still basking in the afterglow of winning that Pro-Am? Asking you because I think our fans want to know. I'm just happy that I didn't destroy her career. She had bookend 66s. I think she finished in the top 15. So I feel relieved that I didn't ruin Ryu's career. But yes, it was great. I've been riding high on it. And the only thing that was better than that this week was when I was on your guys' trading spaces call just as a voyeur, and then you saw me and you put me on it, and you made that call yesterday at one o'clock when the S&P was still up 20 some handles and said, the market will end up down on day, listen to me, trust me. I thought that was a pretty bold call. So that was impressive, guys. So I'm still on the high, but you've continued it for me with that call from yesterday, so I'm fired up. So you mentioned that it was Monday. It just felt wrong. There were so many things taking place beneath the surface, as they say. Now we're taping this on Tuesday day, I believe that is, is the kids say. And again, things don't feel right. The S&P flat on the day, I get it. But below the surface, beneath the surface, under the hood, a lot of bad things going on, Dan Nathan. Just like yesterday, guy, if you were to look up and you were to see the things that were green on your board and you say, ah, seems like a pretty reasonable day. The S&P was up 10, 15 handles. But then you scoot over there and you look at some of the NASDAQ names, some high valuation names. You look at the SPACs, even crypto was under pressure. I mean, there was a lot of really nasty stuff. And then it wasn't just in some of the high valuation names. I'm looking at Disney melt every day. And guy, to give you some kudos here after they report a couple of weeks ago, you made a strong case after the disappointing sub numbers that that should be a $135 stock. Well, here it is. It's about $150 now, and it's not far from there. And it just seems like the air is coming out. A lot of stories that were extremely popular over the last six to nine months or so. So when you look around and you say, okay, fine, Apple's outperforming. You're seeing the banks act really well. You're seeing energy stocks continue to trade really well. I just don't know how long those sectors can hold this up. When you look at the sort of devastation that's happening in the average stock in the NASDAQ. You also consider that failed breakout in the Russell 2000 in small caps. So to me, it seems like there is a handful of stocks holding up this entire market very near all-time highs with huge concentration risk, in my opinion. If you take out those top names, though, and you go under the surface here, let's just look at a couple that reported Zoom and Best Buy. Let's just look at those. Both traded up post print. They were decent quarters. The outlooks were fine. I went through this. I couldn't find anything where I did not see where things were destroyed or unexpected. So now you have two stocks right now down between 14 and 17% on the day. They're both trading up post market. Best Buy trades obviously at a low double digit P multiple, I believe, right? So it's not a quote expensive stock. So I guess the question for the retail investor that's out there is like, what is this? Did I run this thing up too far? The answer is obviously yes. Where do I rebuy this thing? What do I do now with these stocks? And I think that confusion in the market right now, it's very unsettling. You look at the VIX, you look, it's percolating. It wants to go up. And then I watched something called the move, which Merrill Lynch created years ago. So the move index, as it, just think of the VIX, the move is what's done for fixed income and treasuries. We talk about the volatility in the treasury market. It's not so much where they are and the direction they go. It's just unsettling how volatile it is. So I think all this is a recipe, not great going into Thanksgiving for recipes, but not great. And I think it's just an unsettled market right now. By the way, no question about it. My stuffing recipe is banging. I will tell you the key to that is you want to put a little sweet sausage and spicy sausage in it. It catches people by surprise. What also has caught people by surprise, 
Zoom, from this time last year, effectively, let's call it 13 months, it was Halloween, stock's down 60 60%. I mean, that's mind boggling when you think about it. It's not a small company. Even with that move, Zoom is still a $60 billion company, Dan Nathan. So you've talked about it. S&P 500, yeah, I get it. All time highs. Everything looks great. But some major companies are just breaking down in ways we haven't seen in maybe 12 or 13 years. This is not on the company. The company is seeing deceleration. They're seeing some churn. This is all expected. I think they're actually probably executing very well in a pretty difficult environment. If you think about it, this has to do with investor expectations and then obviously sell side expectations. I know that a lot of analysts kind of got off this train a while ago, but again, you're down nearly 65%. You're making new 52 week lows right here. And like you said, it's a 60 some billion dollar market cap company. There's nothing to do with it. It was trading at 16 times sales heading into the print last night. They do have a good balance sheet. They raised billions of dollars earlier this year. So there's probably going to be some strategic M and A. They tried to buy a company earlier this year. They were not able to do that. But there's so many different stories. We talked about this. This is a Niedermeyer market. Work from home, dead. Peloton, work out from home, dead. Teladoc, doctor from home, dead. Chegg, school from home, dead dead. What else? Help me out here, Danny Moses. You're like a good movie guy. (laughs) Yeah. I realize, Dan, that these aren't huge market caps, but I think some of these are indicative. GameStop is getting throttled again today. Look at that chart. That does not look good. It looks like it's going to be headed much lower. But again, AMC's of the world. There's no business at AMC. Yes, it's movie theaters. Yes, you cannot justify that valuation. So when that has its day down to 30, 25, 20, where is the buy point? So we're going to get more and more of this happening every single day. And I think retail investors are waking up to this fact. And I think raising cash here is the smart thing to do. I'm not saying to go heavily short here, but in a market like this where things feel this uncertain to me, I don't know. Hey, Danny Moses, I'm going to tee you up here. I'm not looking to make your eyes glaze over on Thanksgiving, folks. Okay, number one. But number two, we don't talk about two-year yields nearly as much as we should. They have gone, Danny Moses, from about 20 basis points two months ago to 60 basis points. I'm not the brightest bulb in the fixture, but I can do that math. There is something very wrong with the bond market right now, in my opinion. I think all that is is pricing in where the Fed's going to be moving, right? So Powell got reappointed, obviously, since our last podcast. That was expected, I guess, if Brainerd had come in maybe a little bit more dovish. But the president of the Atlanta Fed said yesterday, you know, maybe we should speed this taper up and start increasing rates a little bit sooner. So I think the two years is just a reflection of kind of the Fed funds. And within that, we talked about this before, tenure obviously is spiking up as well. So I actually believe that if you were to tell me that the S&P is going to be higher in 2022, I think the 10-year yields will move higher slowly. If you start to see the 10-year yields come in and the 210 spread, as we call it, starts to go into double digits, we're about there under 100 and starts to move lower, I'd be very concerned that the market is telling you that the Fed raising rates means that we're going to go into recession and potentially enter the dreadful stagflation. So I watch the two-year, I think it's much more tied to Fed funds, I guess, in a nutshell, Guy. So on this Thanksgiving week, Washington is absolutely back in the mix. Fed Chair Powell being reappointed, apparently. You know what? Good for him. That's probably a healthy thing for the market, number one. Number two, the Biden administration making the decision, along with other countries, to tap into the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, which I think is problematic. I think it's political. It doesn't really matter. The question is, Danny Moses, is it going to have the intended outcome? I would say no. I think Tom Lee wrote about something calling it, this has the potential to backfire. I'm curious as to your thoughts. I just want to give the facts here. The Strategic Petroleum Reserve, which everyone is now on Investopedia looking it up, has 620 million barrels of oil in it. The last time that it was tapped for a non-test reason was in 2012, which was a million barrels for Tropical Storm Isaac. In 2011, 30 million barrels from Obama when he tapped it during the Libya confrontation. So this doesn't get used a lot. I think it gets talked about to try to jawbone prices down. But 50 million barrel release really doesn't do anything when the demand in the U.S. is alone is 20 million barrels a day. The SPR can process, I think, 4.4 million barrels a day. It's much more bark than bite. And the 100 million barrels a day is the global demand for oil. And it kind of remains to be seen what China and South Korea and Japan are going to do. But a little bit from India, a little bit from the UK doesn't do much. But it actually gave the OPEC plus countries a little bit of cover to say, okay, let's see what happens. And now that it really didn't work, and now it's only day one, so maybe it'll end up coming down a little bit. 
I just don't know if the correlation between inflation and oil is as strong as it has been in the past, right? There's a study which says for every $10 move in oil, it's like 0.1 for inflation. And the only time it really mattered for inflation was in the 70s when oil went from $3 to 30. So anyway, it was expected. But to the retail investors out there that are wondering why oil is up, because I don't think this is big enough to really matter when you look at those numbers. That's all I wanted to say on that. And before we go to your NFL picks, which by the way, have been redonkulous, Chairman Powell being reappointed, is that just basically the market breathes a sigh of relief? Or is that market moving thing? Tenure yields as we're making this are north of 165. It's interesting. I think the knee jerk would have been to the extent that Lael Brainerd would have a shot. Rates probably would have gone lower. Here we are at 165 in the 10 year. Powell getting another four years, Danny Moses. I think you're right. I think the expectations were that he would probably get it. I think the Wall Street banks were a bit relieved that Brainerd wasn't made chair. She's going to be vice chair, obviously, so she'll certainly have power. But look what the dollar's done since then. And then the president of the Atlanta Fed comes out and says, you know what? We may need to taper quicker and we need to raise rates sooner. And all that put together is having an effect. And we talked about the Turkish lira last week. It breached 13 at one point today. I think it's just under. It was at six and a half two years ago. So yes, is it a huge economy? No, it's not small. It's $800 billion. But what the dollar can do when it makes moves like that is cause those issues to pop up in emerging markets and smaller countries that together can have a real impact on the market. So there's something going on here, obviously, and things continue to percolate in the bond market as we've seen. Two things that caught my eye, guys, before we get out of here, and I picked it up on a website. I like to look for stats that kind of meet my theme, which is obviously an expensive market, but what they call GARP versus GAP, which is a metric growth versus value. Is it growth at a reasonable price or growth at any price? It's at the highest level it's ever been in terms of growth versus value. It actually just went through what year? 2000. And the other thing is what he called bad breath which is 35% of stocks are now below the 200-day moving average relative to the level of the S&P. It's a massive gap. So he called that one mind the gap. So just two things that caught my eye that just add more fuel to the fire potentially that we're going to see some type of sell-off here. No question. You see these numbers, the comparisons that people are making with this market to 1999, again, like what we saw a couple of years ago, what we saw in the late 1920s, early 1930s, all those comparisons are out there. The only thing that hasn't happened is the S&P continues to grind higher regardless. So we'll see if that day of reckoning is coming. But what is coming, Danny Moses, are your NFL picks. I believe as we sit here, you are now 16 and 1 in NFL picks, which is almost statistically impossible. As we get into week now, is this week 12? Is, am I correct week in 12. saying that? Yep. Unbelievable. What do you got for us, Danny Moses? I like the Vikings getting three against San Francisco. Both teams are playing pretty well. Vikings actually got lucky to beat the Packers. That was some bad coaching at the end, some bad play calling. I won't go over it here, but I would take the Vikings plus three, Dan, if you want to take the Niners. I do like the Packers at home against the Rams. Tons of injuries for the Packers. I don't even know if Jones is going to play or not, but I always take the Packers at home. Yeah, I know the Rams are coming off a bye week. And the last one, the Steelers in that conference game is such a rivalry. You know I like the Bengals overall, but I would always take – Steelers on the point. So these are none of my official picks, but I'm happy to let you take the other side of any of those three. You owe me four dimes. What do you got, Dan? I'm going to take all three, the other side of all three for 500 each, okay? All right. So you have San Francisco minus three, you have the Rams even, and then you have the Bengals laying three and a half all for 500 on your end, correct? You got it. Okay. This is either going to 5,500, which is an astronomical number, or you pare it down to, I guess, 2,500. One way or another, we got something to root for. I'm looking forward to it. Listen, everybody out there, have a wonderful Thanksgiving. Hopefully, you're listening to this today, Thanksgiving Day. Danny, Dan, wishing the best to you and your families. Love you both. Want a parting words here, Dan, Nathan? Yeah, right back at you, Guy. It's been a fun couple weeks here. Amanda Diaz, thank you for all your help. We are very thankful for you. And thank you guys all for listening to us. With CME Group Micro Futures and Options, you can get the same access and capital efficiencies of our standard contracts with less upfront financial commitment. Diversify your portfolio and add flexibility by trading CME Group Micro Contracts in Precious Metals, FX, Energy, and Equity Indices. Learn more about what adding futures can do for you at cmegroup.com backslash micros. David Rosenberg is the president and chief economist and strategist of Rosenberg Research and Associates, an economic consulting firm where he and his team provide investors with analysis and insights to help them make well-informed investment decisions. Prior to Rosenberg Research, David was a chief economist and strategist at Gluskin Chef and the chief North American economist at Merrill Lynch in New York. 
David, welcome to On The Tape. DR, it is great to have you join us on the tape. Listen, you've been in the industry a long time. In my opinion, so much has changed since you first started. What is the biggest change you've seen specifically over the last 18 months as we get through COVID with the economy seemingly going one way and the stock market going the other? All I can say is that this is not the first time that uh, the stock market and the real economy have gone in different directions. I mean, we had the weakest economic expansion of all time from 2009 to 2000 and early 20, and the stock market went up fivefold. So the stock market is really operating on liquidity, interest rates. Remember, it's a long duration asset, and it's not really correlated with the economy that much anymore. So the markets are operating on a lot of things out there that are more liquidity related than they are really related to the economy. Uh, right now, it's not the economy that will be the enemy to the stock market. It's going to be what the Fed does or doesn't do in the next 12 to 18 months on interest rates. Rosie, so we go back to mid-2000s, your call when you were at Merrill with us and our team, Steve Eisman used to hit me every day, get Rosie on the phone, get Rosie on the phone, because you could see clearly what was happening. It was much simpler times back then because the Fed wasn't as involved as they are today. And your point you just made, I mean, this is unprecedented as far as what the Fed has done to make people go out on the risk curve in all assets. And so as we unwind this, if that ever occurs, I guess you're caught between inflation coming back in because the stock market will have that unvirtuous impact on the wealth effect on everybody? Or is it more just a reversion to the mean or some combination of both as we look ahead into 2022? Well, look, I think they absolutely look, there's two different things, consumer inflation and asset inflation. And I think that the consumer inflation is not going to be a pervasive problem. I know that the consensus thinks the opposite, but there's a risk here that the Fed's not going to take any chances. And the market's already pricing in three rate hikes for next year. And you know what happens if the Fed starts to move, the market starts pricing in a whole cycle right away. And it's going to be difficult for the Fed to get the genie back into the bottle. So look, why did the markets do what they're doing? Equities, residential real estate, they're the longest duration assets. They are so sensitive to interest rates, irrespective of the economy. And I'll tell you why I think that inflation is not going to be a problem. Because even within the consumer inflation numbers, there's two numbers. There's the areas that are sensitive to COVID, the supply chain stuff related to the labor market shortages. Inflation in those COVID sensitive sectors are up 5% at an annual rate. The services and goods not sensitive to COVID. Inflation there is barely more than 2%. It's actually lower now than it was back in early 2020. Most people don't know that, but you have to do analysis on the numbers. And my contention is gonna be that the 5% COVID sensitive sectors are gonna mean revert or converge on that 2%. So I think that The inflation right now is going to converge on 2%. It could take a year or two to even get there, but I think that we're going to see that happen again. The big risk is really assets, because even when you adjust for where interest rates are, the valuations and equities and residential real estate is at least 15% above the levels they've been at in the past. So otherwise, when you normalize for even these low interest rates, these asset prices move 15% above, say, their intrinsic value. So pick your poison on this. If you believe that the pent-up demand will subside, that means that with the S&P trading at, let's say, 22 times 2022 earnings, that you're in the camp that were way overvalued. I'm not telling you to make necessarily a market huge sell-off call, but there's some people in there that are rooting for a little bit of inflation because maybe there's some form of soft landing. So how would you tell an investor out there right now looking into 2022 with all your experience that you've had, if you are right about your inflation call, what does that mean to the stock market? My big concern for the markets in general, and look, I'd say this for high yield, which is no longer high and no longer yield. You're not really compensated for default risk in the market for corporate credit. And so I'm concerned about valuations in general and risk assets. Ultimately, I think they'll mean revert. What the catalyst is remains to be seen. Maybe the Fed's got to nudge rates up to accomplish that. Actually, when you go and you take a look at some of the commentary from the Fed, a lot of the reason why they want to do tapering early and more quickly is because of their concern over valuations in asset markets. And I think that we should respect the fact they are concerned about asset values. On the consumer inflation side, I think the impact is going to be on the long bond. I'm still actually very bullish on the long bond. I think that there's a lot of inflation priced in that might make sense today, but I don't think it's going to materialize down the road. 
And I think there's a lot of Fed priced in that's probably not going to materialize either. So I don't believe that we're going to have a cataclysmic decline in asset values. But I think we have to understand that we are in, if it's not a bubble, it's a very large sud. So valuations alone, irrespective of interest rates, have me concerned over risk assets right now. I'm willing to be patient. But as far as consumer inflation is concerned, my view is actually a fairly optimistic view. Because if this inflation persists and the Fed has to invert the yield curve to contain it, then we go into a recession. And all of a sudden, my view that maybe we're 15% overvalued on real estate and equities, all of a sudden, the Fed has to hike rates to contain consumer inflation. Then it's not a 15% decline anymore. It's more like 30%. So, David, on that note, this week, we had Fed Chair Powell renominated. We saw this huge spike in two-year yield, and it was like a switch was flipped. If you looked at high valuation tech stocks in the first couple days of this week, they're just getting absolutely pummeled, to your point about valuations. But one of the things that we've been talking about on the tape for the last few months or so, the crowding in the mega cap tech names, and you know the top six names, they make up nearly $10 trillion in market cap. They make up nearly 25% of the S&P 500, nearly 50% of the NASDAQ 100. Is that the next shoe to drop? And then at that point, I don't care if money's rotating into energy, into financials. They're just not big enough here. And it just seems like there's a real accident waiting to happen in equities right now. Right. Well, remember that the stocks that you mentioned are the classic growth stocks and growth stocks by definition are the longest duration stocks. And then by definition, very sensitive to interest rates. But more on that is the degree of concentration that you talked about, which is extremely unhealthy because the top five stocks represent 25% of the market cap. And really, you have to go back to 1969 to see the last time we had that market concentration. And we know exactly what happened in the next 12 years. It was 12 years of famine. And nobody saw that coming. So look, it's not an attempt here to be uber bearish. It's just the valuations that you talked about, the CAPE multiple, because everybody looks at a one-year forward multiple. Well, why would you do that for a long duration asset like equities? But that's become commonplace in the stock market in these past number of years. But the CAPE, the smooth price earnings multiple, is at 40. And it's only been there 2% of the time in the past. Only 2% of the time in the past 120 years has the Cape multiple been this inflated. And returns 12 months and out historically with that starting point on the multiple have been negative. I hate to say it, but that's just the facts. 2% of the time, it's a three standard deviation event to have the multiple this high. Look at the margin debt. The margin debt has exploded. The leverage backing this market is incredible. Portfolio managers in the United States on net 2% cash ratio. There's no margin for error here. Everybody is thrown caution to the wind. It's rather incredible. And then you've got this degree of market concentration at the same time. So I'm a little bit nervous. And it's not just equities. Look at residential real estate. Housing is a lot bigger deal for the household balance sheet. And you know, we got the numbers yesterday, the existing home sale numbers. Look at the prices. It takes now six and a half years of worker wages to buy a house. And that is basically... 30% higher than it's been in the past. Now you'll say, well, interest rates are lower. I was saying before, even you adjust for interest rates in both equities and residential real estate, the excess of valuation, overvaluation is 15%. And then if you layer on interest rate risk on top of that, if the futures market is right, if they actually now believe, now Powell's carte blanche to start raising rates as early as next spring or summer, going to be a very interesting time period. And my sense is that if we end up getting interest rate increases, and maybe the Fed will do it whether or not we get the inflation just as an insurance policy, Powell's coming under a lot of pressure to do that, right? A lot of hawks on the FOMC. Well, then what happens to the inflation outlook if we get a reverse wealth effect on spending from asset deflation? But I'll tell you that the virtual guarantee, we will not be talking about consumer inflation this time next year. We will be talking about something else. Rosie, let me get this straight, because when you were at Merrill on the sell side, and we've talked about on the show before, if you're bearish on the sell side and wrong, you get fired. If you're bullish and wrong, you keep your job. You were in the worst of all scenarios. You were bearish and right, and basically Merrill went under, so to speak. And so everybody kind of left there. But you don't sound as if you have as much conviction here. And I'm not selling this because you're selling newsletters and you're scared that you're not going to sell as many if you're bearish. But what you just laid out, I've heard you lay this out in a very different voice, meaning 
with clarity in 2006 and seven, what was happening that was inevitable that the consumer was going to get destroyed because they had too much leverage. You sound like you're hedging just a little bit. What is it about it that you're not sure? Why not make a conviction call? This market has one direction to go in the equity market and it's down. Well, I think I made the case that I think the equity market is going to be heading down. I just said, it. I don't think it's going to be a cataclysmic decline. And don't forget what the markets did back when I was at Merrill was far worse than I ever would have thought. So I don't think this is going to become a run on banks or a major financial crisis. I think we're going to have just a reset. Now, don't forget, without any material damage to the economy, as it turned out, of course, Pell pivoted, but we had almost a 20% drawdown back in late 2018. And these things happen. And that happened actually against the backdrop of rising rates and a flatter yield curve. The difference is that the extreme overvaluation and market concentration is much more acute today than it was back then. But yeah, it's a matter of degree. I think that in terms of conviction, I think the market is more likely to be down 15 to 30 percent in the next 12, 24 months. DR, you mentioned in no short things. Well, clearly you don't listen to On the Tape because my man Danny Moses is now 16 and 1 in the NFL, which is redonkulous, as they say. So, yes, there are short things. And yes, Virginia, there is a Santa Claus. I'm going to throw some numbers at you. I want you to opine. Get ready. Here it comes. U.S. debt to GDP, 150%. International, global debt to global GDP, 110%. Fed balance sheet this time next year, $10 trillion. You explain to me how those things are going to rectify themselves because I've said this and I believe it. The biggest villains of the 21st century, all these central bankers who are seemingly all-knowing. Thoughts? Well, look, here's the thoughts. And one word or less, which is very difficult for me, as you know, Japanification. And I was saying that in the last cycle, everybody was wondering, how did we end up having the funds rate peak at the lowest level ever? How was it that bond yields peaked at the lowest level ever? How is it that we had no wage or wage inflation, actual inflation with 3.5% unemployment? Don't forget the unemployment rate in Japan is below 3% with no inflation. Because the debt is a tourniquet, the extreme level of debt is a constraint on aggregate demand and inflation. It's one of the reasons why I don't have a big inflation view. We're choking on too much debt. How's it going to get resolved? I don't think we're going to inflate our way out of it. The inflation we have right now is called screwflation. This is inflation that's killing real wages. You're not going to grow yourself out of debt with cost push inflation from broken supply chains. I don't think that's going to be permanent in any event. We either at some point have some sort of debt jubilee and the MMTers win out. I don't really think that's going to happen. Or we're just following through, call it muddle along, like Japan has. And look, the Japanese as a population, happy. They don't really have much in the way of high expectations. They vote in the same party every election and they get the same result. So I think that this becomes globally much more like Japan. And we were already starting that process below COVID and it will continue until the debt somehow gets resolved. It either gets resolved through fiscal policy which unfortunately is going to mean the dirty three-letter word tax, or we'll just basically have to find a way to burn all that debt somehow on the Fed's balance sheet. Well, that could create hyperinflation, so I don't think that's going to happen. Or it's just going to be a fact of life until something else changes. But we have to remember that the debt, this is not the same debt. This is unproductive debt that we have right now, and it is disinflationary. And if you go back to actually Jay Powell, Jay Powell gave a brilliant sermon back in August at Jackson Hole. Of course, he hasn't come back to it because I guess he doesn't want to be laughed at anymore as Mr. Transitory. And the stuff he talked about is not out of vogue. It was just in late August. And whether it's debt, whether it's disruptive technology and demographics, all these things have not gone away because of COVID. And they will reassert themselves. And so I think that in answer to your question, It's going to be very difficult, especially when you're taking a look at the aging demographics. Think about what that means for the dependency ratio. How we get rid of this debt, extremely difficult. It's going to act as an ongoing constraint for aggregate demand, and I think, and for inflation. So I think it's really following that road. We're following the Japan road, and we have for some time. And a lot of people, especially the consensus, just don't get it. They've remained unnecessarily bearish on treasuries because they don't see that we're following in the very same footsteps. 
Yeah, it seems pretty clear to me, and you seem to be one of very few voices who are in that camp. I just say this is that prior to the pandemic, David, the 10 year average GDP was 2.2%. And all of those disinflationary forces that you just mentioned, that Jay Powell mentioned about technology, I mean, we weren't worried about wage inflation. You've made the case very clearly that the wage inflation that we've seen over the last year or so is really on unskilled workers, right? It's young workers. These are jobs that are going to be automated away. Way, essentially. So I don't really buy that argument. And then when you think about the fact that we're going to have GDP, it's going to trend back to prior to the pandemic. Inflation is going to come down, as you just talked about. Sovereign balance sheets are going to remain really bloated. Does it make a great environment for risk assets in general? Because you just talked about housing's overinflated. Fine, rates are going to stay low. So maybe that helps the housing multiples there. But the stock market, I just have to think that we pulled forward so much growth. We pulled forward so much concentration in a handful of those names. It just really seems like when consensus comes around to the fact that inflation is in fact transitory, no matter what the definition, whether it was three months or a year and a half, because Ultimately, I think we're going to be looking back, as you say, next spring, and we're going to be like, oh, well, there you go. That was inflation. How do we need to think about when consensus comes around to the fact that inflation is going back to those prior levels and GDP is going back to those prior levels? Well, look, I think that'll be very good news for the treasury market. When you look at the five-year break-evens, it's over 3%. We haven't had 3% plus inflation over a five-year period since the early 80s, okay, since the Reagan years, where demand, where demand was booming, the advent and proliferation of the two-income family booming. So the market thinks inflation is going to average over 3% the next five years, and it's just basically because people in the markets, like In everyday life, they extrapolate the current experience into the future. Five years is a long time, and I would tend to agree with you. I think that once the pandemic ends, the supply curve is going to shift. We're going to have fewer of these bottleneck pressures. I don't believe for a second that we've hit the wall on the supply of labor. And even if we have, take a look right now at the production of robotics. A lot of people that think I'm going to leave the labor force for the next couple of years. Oh, I'm going to rely on my 401k or I'm going to wake up and smell the coffee. When you come back to get that job two years from now, guess what? It's probably not going to be there for you. So, like I said before, you know, I don't believe in new eras. You'd say to me, well, if you're bullish on long-term rates, wouldn't you therefore be bullish on long-duration assets like residential real estate and equities? And under normal circumstances, I would be. But I've done the work. Me and my team have done the work. And we found that even when you adjust for interest rates, the S&P 500 is 15% above quotes where it should be. Okay? Based on historic normalized levels, when you normalize interest rates, God forbid, you could be down 30%, not 15%, but we're 15% overvalued on equities, even adjusting for interest rates. And by the way, the same holds true for residential real estate, where now it takes six and a half years of worker wages to buy a home. That is abnormal. You'd say, well, that's justified by low interest rates. And I would say, no, 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 no. Maybe about a year ago it was. But we've got 15% excess valuations right now. So even with my bullish view on inflation, I think I'd rather be at the long end of the treasury curve. I want to wait for the stock market to get down at least 15%. The market goes down 15% from here. We get the S&P down to 4,000. So long as we're not going to recession, you're going to see me pounding my fist on the table to get back into the stock market. David, one of the things I think that's been underappreciated, certainly by professional investors, is the scale that the retail investor in this market. And I'm not even saying what the stats say is that I'm not going to look at every household, what percentage of stocks do they own. I'm talking about the outspokenness and the stock communities. They are a powerful force for sure, which is good and bad. It can run the market up. It can run certain stocks up to levels that don't trade on fundamentals. When that ends, obviously that'll be painful. I want to get your thoughts on just retail participation in general. And also, you really haven't talked about crypto at all. And I'm just curious what your thoughts are on crypto since uh, you've been around the block as well. So, Look, I can start off with crypto as part of facilitating an efficient medium of exchange in e-commerce or commerce in general. I think that the blockchain technology is phenomenal and it's a game changer. I just have to tell you, I don't own any crypto and I don't know why anybody would be using something that I view as a currency as something that you'd want to treat as an investment. So I really don't get it. And I can't even get the valuations. And look, there were times I was bullish on gold and bearish on gold. And a lot of it would be predicated on real interest rates and 
US dollar and maybe as a haven in troubled times. But how did you ever value gold? Whoever determined where gold was going to be, unless you had a view as to what geopolitics were going to look like, or if you had a view around the US dollar, I could get that. We don't know whether this is some great new investment. We understand the role it plays in commerce. Is it a great investment? Time will tell. It certainly has proven to be so far, but for all I know, it's just the, the greater fool's theory. So that's my view on crypto. In terms of the retail investor participation, it's interesting. I don't have a particularly strong view on that. Does that represent a big risk to the market? We have no sample size on this. We can't do any sort of cycle by cycle theory on it. I have other concerns about the market, which is the extreme overvaluations, the market concentration, the extreme leverage underpinning the market. There's other things worrying me about the market right now, the ETF participation, the passive investing cycle. My big worry is what happens in the next bear market? The elephant in the room is gonna be passive ETF investing, which has been so dominant from a cash in the market perspective. What happens when those things unwind? That could reinforce the selling pressure. But I would say this much for anybody who really wants to get a good gauge, the Fed's uh, semi-annual financial stability review had a whole chapter on this. It was around 20 pages on exactly what you're talking about. It's hard for me to assess, but let me just say that this is definitely on the Fed's radar screen. David, it's great having you join us. I've long said that passive investing is great on the way up, but I got to tell you something, when things go pear-shaped, it ain't going to be passive. It's going to be active on the way down, and that's going to be problematic. But we've enjoyed having you with us. We look forward to having you once again on On The Tape. Hopefully, you'll join us on Fast Money at some point. Thank you, DR. It's been a pleasure. Thanks once again to CME Group for sponsoring this episode of On The Tape. If you liked what you heard, make sure you hit follow and leave us a review. It helps people find our show and we love hearing from you. And we also want to hear from you via email at onthetape at riskreversal.com any time of the day. Follow and connect with us on Twitter at On The Tape Pod, and we'll see you next time. On The Tape is a Risk Reversal media production. This podcast is for informational purposes only. All opinions expressed by me, Dan Nathan, Guy Adami, Danny Moses, and any other participants are solely our opinions and should not be relied upon for specific investment decisions. Mm-hmm.